Hello, good afternoon and welcome to New Forest Morphs. Um, today I've um, just wanted to give you a quick update on, on what's happening here at New Forest Morphs. We've had a couple of new deliveries. We've ordered some um, gel for our, it's called Anna Gel. It's actually for the ultrasound that's on its way. It's coming from China, so it could be um, a bit longer than we're expecting. Um, we're on the 15th of October, and this, well, 17th of October. Mid-October is the perfect time normally in the UK to start your breeding program for your ball pythons. And what I thought I'd do is rather than wait for the ultra scan to come, so I can show you how I'm planning to use that to identify which females are ready to be paired, I'm gonna use my natural instincts. So most of us don't have ultrasounds, so I think I'm gonna just today, just share some of my natural instincts that I use to be able to work out without the ultrasound when a female's ready and when the males are ready but I will show you the technology that is coming and how we're going to use it. Now normally we want the girls to have a egg or follicle size, which is the beginning of the egg growth, of about 10 millimeters is what they normally recommend. And obviously you can't measure that with uh, your hands. You have to basically make a judgment call as to whether you think your female is ready to be paired. Now obviously what you don't want to do is you don't want to put your male to a girl and use your male unnecessarily if the female is not ready. So having the ultrasound when it comes should help us be a little bit more pinpoint accurate with, um, with that. Um, but the other option you have is that you can actually use um, visual, visual cues and you can use your hands to actually palpate the female to work out whether she's got um, follicles growing and roughly how many follicles are in there as well. So what I thought we'd do is I'll just show you what came uh, this week. We're going to be using a company called Anagel for the ultrasound gel. So they give you, the cheapest way of doing it is to buy it in big packs because you get through quite a lot when you do it. So this has already arrived. So I think that's five liters, which cost about 24 pounds. And they give you a kit. So you can pour, I think you screw this onto the lid here and that allows you to pour it into here. And then you can squirt this out onto your probe that you're gonna get with the ultrasound. And what I've done is I've actually got on the wide TV behind us, I've got, um, uh, the cost of the ultrasound. Now they can range from anything from as low as 500 pounds all the way up to 20 or 30 thousand pounds for a professional veterinary. Might spend as much as 10, 15 or 20 thousand on a really good ultrasound. Um, I've basically spent 870 pounds on the one I'm getting or 1100 dollars um, because I reckon it's going to give us enough information to help us. The pictures won't be crystal clear, but they'll be able to home in and we'll be able to find the size of those follicles before we start pairing. But what we're going to do is because we've got um, the conditions are right, the weather is going to be forecasting a stormy, wet weather coming to the UK in the next day or two. And we've already had a lot of rain five or six days earlier. So the humidity of the facility is rising. Um, we're running about 60 to 65 percent which is pretty good ambient humidity. But actually they do recommend that in the actual enclosures themselves that you want to get as high as 70, 75 or even 80% for a day or two while you're putting your male and females together. And the humidity stimulates the breeding um, and assists with the breeding cycles. So normally a good time to pair is um, check the climate that you're in, see what's going on with the weather. The stormier the weather, the wet the weather, the wetter the weather, the better normally. And uh, that's what we normally use as our cue. But obviously before we go there, the preparation starts much, much earlier. The preparation starts um, on the feeding of both the males and the females um, months and even years earlier, depending on uh, how long you've had your snakes. Now they do recommend normally about three years a female will start to mature two and a half to three years is the minimum age normally where you'd want to pair your girls to the boys, but that doesn't guarantee anything because you can have a three-year-old female that might only be a few hundred grams. So obviously, so they combine that with a weight and the minimum weight is normally 1500 grams for a female and 700 grams for a male. But obviously we want to make sure they are sexually mature. So what Jared and I have been doing is we've been going through all our new boys and we've got four or five new boys that are coming into our breeding rotation uh, this year. And uh, they will be Hercules, which is our, um, here he is here. Hercules is a pastel inchy leopard lesser clown. So he's carrying four codoms and a clown gene. 
and uh, today I've actually just put him in with Isa, who's our Desert Ghost Enchi 100% Het Caramel. Now, Jared has checked his sperm, and he is now producing sperm. He's about 18 months old, which is about the right age to minimum age that you want to be putting your boy in. And he's weighing close to 1100 grams. So he's way beyond the 700 grams. He's sexually mature. And the female he's going to is also two and a half years of age. She is 1900 grams and she's been pounding food. So some of the preparations before you decide to pair is are the girls pounding, are the boys eating to sustain themselves through the breeding cycle? If I've got a first time male, I'm only put that male to one or two girls once a month because I don't want to overstress them and overwork them. And hence the ultrasound when it comes will give us the opportunity to make sure that when we bring in Hercules, we're bringing him in when the follicles of the girls are the right size and normally you know, 10 millimeters is normally the minimum that you want those girls to be before you start um, putting a male in. And they often say the first lock is a stimulating lock. I mean, the girls can hold on to that sperm for as long as 12 months, even longer. So it doesn't mean to say it's completely wasted, but you find that the first locks stimulate the females to eat more ferociously. They stimulate the girls to build follicle growth. And also the boys, obviously, um, a new boy coming in, you want to gently ease them into the breeding rotation because obviously it's all new to them. Um, some of the signs you look for when a female's ready, uh, when you put them together, we put Panda and we put Mowgli together last week and Mowgli went in there and Panda, the big um, girl that we've got, she started wagging her tail like, ferociously like this. It was going up and down the rub. We're thinking she's getting so excited. And what he did is he actually put his spores, which are like little feet to the back of his tail. Um, they're not quite feet, but they're like um, sharp objects that can come out. And they actually manipulate the, the, they touch the female gently and they stimulate her into a breeding, uh, prepared to breeding. So it's almost like a little bit of foreplay. And what happens is the girls get excited. They then, like say in Panda's case, she was moving very quickly around the rug, getting excited and she was wagging her tail like this. And that's a cell cell sign that she's, you know, ready to breed because she's showing that she's willing to do that. Now, Mowgli didn't lock to her because Mowgli is um, our brand new male that hasn't actually learned how to do that. But I think over time he will learn how to lock to her. So even though the first time you put them together, the female was ready, the boy wasn't quite ready to do the business. Now they recommend that you normally spend up to no more than a couple of days putting a pairing together. Now they can lock where the boy's hemipenes go into the female's clerica and they actually lock, a bit like my finger, like this. And, um, sh and what happens is that the, he can pass the sperm over to the female within literally hours. And sometimes a lock can only has to happen for an hour or two and the job could be done and they could unlock. Now I'm not saying necessarily I'd separate them at that point because they can do multiple locks in their breeding season. So Jad and I allow at least one day with the pairings together. And then if they haven't paired uh, or locked, it isn't all wasted. It sometimes means they need a second day. And often I've actually left my males in for a second day and come up and found that they've locked the second day. So each animal can take its time preparing to get into that breeding season. So don't be disappointed if you haven't got a lock straight away and it might take a little bit longer. So there's a few little things there. And in terms of other preparation, now before we even put the um, animals together, well, we obviously have lots of planning to make sure that our projects are being furthered. So the key is to gain a vision of what you want to achieve, something that you can look forward to every time you go into the rub and you see what's happening, you're getting excited that the outcome could be something that is definitely going to get you excited. And I think that's the key to successful breeding. Like Jared, for example, was brought a lovely boy called Skip. And Skip is with, a, um, he's, a, he's a gravel and he's 100% het for clown and he's a pastel and I think he's a super pastel. So he's got all the ingredients that Jared was looking for in a male. And he's put that male to Mango who's a pastel and she is a clown and she is a lesser. And what he's hoping to produce there is he wants to produce a visual clown that has gravel in it and pastel in it so that he can use that male to go into another female he's preparing for next season which is Bella. Now I weighed Bella 
today and she is 1,353 grams. She's a couple of years old and we want to wait for her to get up to size, maybe 1,800 to 2,000 grams for next season. But while she's building for that, we wanted to get the gravel boy into a mature female mango who's weighing 2,200 grams. She's a first time breeder for us as well. She's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, we've put them together once and they've locked. So he locked on his first opportunity. So we're really pleased. And so what we did is we actually checked, first of all, for health. So the first thing you would do, but once you've got your vision and your plan, is you then check for the health of the animals. And the things you look at is you look at their eyes. Are they clear? Are they healthy? Um, then, then are they hydrated? Now, if you get eyes that are going in and they haven't got enough humidity, that's a sign that they're not healthy. So check the eyes of your animals. That's one thing you can do. The other thing we do is we open up their mouths to make sure they've got no saliva or excess saliva or no bubbling at the mouth. There's no RI issue in either the male or the female. So we check that they're not wheezing. We make sure that they're fully healthy before we put them together. So if you have a problem snake and you start breeding with it, it can run through your collection very quickly. So these precautions are very wise and very think good thing to do before you start pairing is check for uh, RI, check for mites, make sure there's no mites in your collection before you start pairing. Check to make sure there's no scale rot on the animals. Look at the stools of the animals. So if the stools are nice and firm and they're not runny or they're not squidgy, if they're runny and squidgy and they've got diarrhea, there's an underlying problem with the snake and I'd hold back pairing a snake that's got that. And you'd take that to the vet and the vet would then diagnose your snake and hopefully give you the necessary treatments that you need to bring that snake back into health and you move that away from your collection and then you would actually put it into quarantine and make sure it goes through two or three months of health checks before it then comes back into the collection and certainly you wouldn't breed with that until that um, snake is healthy again. So there's some things to consider. Um, so once you've done your health checks and you've also checked to make sure that the boys are sexually mature by checking for sperm and also that they are of good weight, minimum 700. We like to go for eight, 900 to 1,000 on the boys. And for the girls, we like them to be two and a half to three years minimum. They've got to be sexually mature. Now, obviously, with the ultrascan coming, we can check for follicle growth. But if you haven't got that, what do you check for to see whether your female is sexually mature? Well, there's lots of things that you're, you can do when you actually study the animal. And what we do find is that a lot of the girls will start to bowl wrap, which means that they're cooling their bodies to build follicles because they need to drop their temperature down to allow the follicles to grow correctly. So if they start to migrate towards the colder side of the enclosure and wrap around the water bowl, it means that they are cooling the whole process down so they can build their follicles. And that means they're getting ready to breed. So that's normally a good indicator that your girl is starting to reach sexual maturity. You're looking for chunkiness in the female as well. So females normally pack on more weight than males because they know they're preparing themselves for breeding one day. So you'll find that most females are much more aggressive with their feeding than males. And we find that a lot of the girls that we've been growing on, particularly Isa, who's got up to 1,838 grams, she's been pounding food for the last six months and she's telling us that she's building, preparing for breeding one day. So the way they eat and the consistency of their eating, how they're shedding, so coming back to health, if an animal is shedding perfectly and shedding on a regular basis, maybe once every month or so, then that's normally a good indication that they're growing well, shedding well, and they're a healthy animal. So there's another thing to consider. Um, but also there's other things. Now, we believe in using what they call the rhythm of the room to stimulate all the animals to breed that you want in your breeding rotation. And so we'd probably have maybe four or five um, pairs that are breeding over the same period. And what that does, it stimulates and it creates all the hormones are created and they're coming into the facility. And the other animals are picking up. So the other males are gonna get more competitive because they know there's other male hormones that are being generated in the room. So it might stimulate them to breed. There are some other techniques people use. They take the shed of a male and put it into the female's rub. And when the new male goes in, he smells the shed of the, of the other male and thinks, oops, there's competition. I better get a lock in because he wants to put his 
sperm into the girl to produce his babies. So there's another thing that we do. Um, I have also seen um, people actually take a little bit of sperm from the male that's going into the female's rub and they put that on the back of the female to stimulate the male to know what to do, particularly if it's a first time boy that doesn't know what he's doing. So that's another thing that I've seen, uh, which can be quite effective. Now, before we get to that stage, there are some other things that we need to do to prepare for breeding. So they often say that mid-October is a good time in the UK, and it's mainly because temperatures start to drop down, which encourages follicle development. And so nighttime temperatures are normally recommended to drop down to the mid-70s, at night time and then daytime temperatures should be in the higher mid 80s for breeding so what we tend to do is that we tend to let nature's natural cycle because this facility does cool in the evening so even though I have a heater which is on the other end of the facility I'll only put that on if I think it's going to be really really cold nights and they need to be kept at 75 plus up if I think that it's quite a mild day, I might not put the heater on at all and I'll let the natural drop in nighttime temperature stimulate the girls to build follicles, stimulate their breeding. So there's another approach you can take is drop your temps by a couple of degrees at night time and then maintain mid 80s during the day is a nice cycle. Now, if you have to drop your temperatures down, say your temperatures are quite high, they recommend doing this over three or four weeks so that you don't shock your snakes and you do not give them extra stress because they're dealing with big temperature swings. So it's always good to do small incremental changes to actually stimulate the breeding season. So most breeders would probably go three or four weeks before they pair to get their girls and boys at the right level. Now the boys I find often seek the cooler temperatures because they're protecting their sperm. They don't want them, their sperm can be destroyed if it gets overheated. And they do say normally at 90 degrees is probably the maximum you want to go on the hot spot for the boys. Um, because if you go beyond that, you're getting close to the limits of when sperm can be uh, destroyed by heat. And same for the girls. When the girls take on board that sperm, they can destroy that sperm if they go on too hot a spot. So you do want to give them a gradient if possible uh, from probably 78 to 80 on the low side up to about 88 to 90 maximum on the top side. That's probably the, the range and they'll find the range that they feel comfortable. They'll gravitate towards the water cooling bowl and um, the other thing I do is I spray down with water to bring the humidity up. So we're running at about 65% humidity in the facility but when I put them together I want there to be close to 75 or 80%. So before I pair I spray down their enclosure uh, with warm water uh, so it's like the same temperature as the uh, the room so it might be say no more than 80 78 to 80 de uh, degrees Fahrenheit and what that does is it creates that extra humidity and helps the lubrication of the movement of the snakes so they they can often find that um, it's easier for them to to breed and they like the extra humidity um, you'll find that if you don't get your humidity right the snakes if they want to breed they'll tip their water bowls they'll create the atmosphere they often shed poo and do all manner of things in the middle of the breeding and the, the temptation is sometimes to go in there and to clean up and tidy up because you don't want your snakes running through their poo and everything but in actual fact we found that unless it's particularly bad we leave the snakes to get on with it and don't disturb them and uh, I think that's the other key to getting successful locks we we'll obviously when you're a new, new breeder and you're anxious to see your first lock it's so easy to be going in and out of the rubs to see what's going on and I think there's a danger that you'll disturb them I mean they get disturbed by noise they get disturbed by vibrations pulling the drawers in and out is not a good thing to do because the one thing you want to avoid is a male or female getting shocked or surprised and pulling out of their lock they can damage the boys hemipenes and I think the key is to actually allow the animals to naturally find their own natural course and occasionally I peep in and have a little peep. Now this is the other reason why I have clear rubs so I can peer in without actually disturbing if I want to. So these are all other things that we can do to help with the breeding process. Okay so what I was going to do also is I was going to move away from the general rule of having like the weight rule 1500 for the girls and 700 for the boys because that's just a a general rule but you've got to look beyond that because for example like today we had Queenie who just shed out she's a big pastel clown 
I weighed her and she weighed in at 2,778 grams. I thought, fantastic, she's nearly twice what she needs to be. But as I was lifting her, I could feel, because she had been two weeks preparing for her shed, she hadn't eaten for a couple of weeks, she wasn't as full as I want her to be, and she was very empty in some ways. So I thought to myself, even though I'm tempted to put in a male, because she's definitely sexually mature enough, she's definitely big enough, but her conditioning wasn't right. And so I think you need to feel and get a feel for the conditioning of your animals. And so I resisted the temptation to um, breed with her. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll probably wait another three or four weeks, get her back into the feeding. Now that she's shed out, she will feed again and build her up maybe to three, three kilograms because she's such a big girl. And then I'll have a look at her again and make sure that she's, she's thick. You're looking for the lowest side of the snake mid to lower side, you want to start building some thickness, some reserve in there, because a female can lose up to 30 to 35% of their body weight, giving us a clutch. Now, some of them even lose more than that if they're particularly small girls. So I think it's important that we make sure that we build the girls up as best we can. The other thing to consider is that when you start your breeding, you'll find it will stimulate a feeding response. So if you've got a girl that is maybe 15 to 1600, and you pair her up just once, and then you check to see whether her feeding instincts kick in, you may find over the next few weeks that her feeding instincts are gonna to want to pound, 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 if she decides to, to want to breed, because she'll know that she needs to build to get ready for the, for the breeding rotations. Okay, I'll just see whether there's any other bits of information here I can share with you. So the five boys that we've got entering the rotation is Hercules, Giovanni, who's our, and I can bring him out and show you, because he's right here, he did his first lock with Penelope, our pinstripe. Now Giovanni is a super pastel banana G-stripe, and he weighs about 1100 grams, and he's 18 months old. Jared checked him, and he's showing sperm. So we'll bring him out, and I'll just show you an example of a male that is big enough and sexually mature and able to and he's beautiful. So there is Giovanni. He's 18 months plus. Um, I'm just going to see if I can get his head stamp up, head stamp up for you. So you can see he's super pastel. Okay. There he is. And he's a beautiful banana G stripe. And you can see he's got a complete stripe all the way down his body. And he pleased me when I checked him last week when he was with Penelope, the big pink girl. Now this girl didn't go for us last year, didn't go for us the year before, so she's had at least two years rest and she's three, nearly three kilograms and she was showing me signs that she was ready and I thought right this is our chance to be able to produce some beautiful pastel lemon blast if you like, pastel pins with banana in them, banana pastel pins or banana uh, lemon blasts, which I think would be beautiful. 100% het for G-Stripe, which I think we can bring into our clown projects later. So, he did the business and he's absolutely stunning. Really, really happy with him. So we'll just slip him back. And then I'll probably, I won't be bringing out a female because the other thing that a lot of people make the mistake is when you've got girls that are ready to be bred, it's good to avoid overhandling them because they, they need to be comfortable in their environment, they need to be settled, and we always put the boy into the female's enclosure. The other thing is check the sex of both animals because if you put two boys together, they could end up having a big fight. And so, so many snakes are missold often that you think that you've got a girl, you've actually got a boy. It happened to us last season, and I realized that Ezra or Inchi was actually a boy rather than a girl. So. There's a lot of banging and knocking going on when I tried to pair them up. And I thought, what's going on here? This is not natural. And normally if there's a lot of banging going on, it's, it's gonna be caused by two things. Either you've got the sex wrong, and you've got a boy, two boys going in, competing, or you've got complete incompatibility uh, with the animals that you're trying to pair, and there's, there could be some aggression from that even. So that maybe the girl doesn't want to know the boy, and the boy's trying to push himself on him, and the girl could go, go nuts, and she could, make a lot of noise so you've got to be careful with that too. So just in closing um, I think what we're going to do now I'll just check to make sure I've covered most of the points. Um, 
Let's have a look. No attempts. Rest. Yeah, resting your males. Um, I would rest the male for at least three or four days before putting him to another female. First time boys, I probably will give them one, possibly two girls in their first year. Because there's nothing worse than stretching a new boy too far. Because you're weak in his sperm strength and you could end up with slug, slug, slugging out. So I take the philosophy that maybe one or two females, once a month taking those boys out, give them maybe up to three or four uh, weeks to get their strength back and then again, go again. So sometimes doing that means that when you do have the locks, the sperm is a lot stronger. But if you use a boy too much and they go off food, they reduce their size and conditioning and their sperm strength reduces. So being prudent and being careful is really key to that. Um, and most females I would breed maybe sometimes once every three weeks, possibly once every uh, four weeks at certain follicle size. So 10, 10 millimeters is a good start. Then you want to get one in at maybe 20 to 25 millimeters. Um, and then you certainly want to, want to get at least one more lock in around the 35 millimeter mark because when their follicles get to 35 mil, they're very close to ovulation where they release the sperm and the egg will then become, the follicles then become a fertile egg and then she'll go into an ovulation. So you want to get fresh sperm if you can towards the latter stages of the cycle, rotation cycles, and we'll cover that on another video. Okay. Um, the other thing is not to breed. I allow two or three days of digestion. So when I feed my animals, I'll leave them for two or three days before I pair them so that they're digested. Because there's nothing worse than putting in a, a pair together so quickly after a meal, they could regurgitate the meal, could make them very sick. So it's key to give them a chance to digest their food before you do that. Um, right, I think that's about it for now. So I'm just gonna finish up and show you what I've bought it's on its way. So hopefully when it comes, we can do a demonstration of how to use this gel, how to use the ultra scan, and then let me just show you what, I'm, what I've got coming. Okay, so this is the, I think this is on eBay, and it's called uh, an FDA, let's just zoom in on that for you, an FDA CE portable USB digital ultrasound machine scanner 7.5 megahertz and it's a linear probe that you need rather than a convex because a linear probe works better if you're in the us they're about 1200 dollars if you're in the uk 870 they're made in china and it is a slow boat so it would take probably two to four weeks before it arrives i reckon it could be in a couple of weeks uh, everything going well and this is what you get so it looks like a laptop you can see there and there's your probe which is over there and they are I've seen them there's a couple of um, people I know that have got them that like them um, I say they're not top end in terms of costing so it's within our budget but it will give us a scan of the internal organs of the uh, female and we'll be able to identify the size of the follicles which will then mean that we can use the males at the right time to get them into the system so that's the system that you get if you get the wrong probe you will need to request uh, a linear um, if you already have a convex probe rather than a linear they cost about 250 dollars for replacement probes so we're looking forward to sh demonstrating these so thank you very much for watching and we will see you next time so it's goodbye for me and we shall catch you next time thank you very much goodbye